Well, welcome to Virtual Sky Notes for July 2021. More details can be found on the website. When we consider the whole sky view uh, of the July early evening sky, um, about 11.30, um, we see that uh, the prominent constellations of Cygnus, Lyra and Aquila, with Deneb, Vega and Altair forming the summer triangle are now prominent in the east and uh, quite high up overhead almost. If we follow um, the plough round, uh, the handle of the plough round, you can find that the bright star Arcturus, which is quite easily detectable as being orange in colour. If you follow the arc round further still, you come to the, the white star Spica um, in Virgo, low in the, uh, in the, in the southwest. So in the south, we still have good views of the constellation of Sagittarius and uh, all that uh, good stuff down there in the Milky Way, rich star clouds, which are very easily seen with um, binoculars. You can trace the Milky Way from Sagittarius through Scutum all the way up through Cygnus and right the way across to um, Cassiopeia, down into Perseus, into the north northeast. In the east, we can see the square of Pegasus. This is an easy thing to spot. It's quite large. Um, it's a good signpost uh, as, uh, uh, asterism of stars. Um, so you can use that to find a way around the sky as well. By 11.30, we've got actually two planets which are now visible um, mid-month. Uh, these are Saturn in Capricornus and Jupiter in Aquarius. They're still quite low down in, in, in the sky, but worth having a good look at with telescopes, as we see later on. So looking in more detail in the south, you can see that the teapot asterism of Sagittarius is just poking above the horizon. Uh, you need a good sudden aspect to see that. Um, and all the, the rich star clusters and so on are situated in the Milky Way, which effectively is the steam from the spout side of the teapot asterism. So if you move up from uh, the constellation of uh, Sagittarius, we come to this sprawling constellation of uh, Aphucus, which has some nice clusters in it, M12, M10, M14, worth having a look at as we get darker evenings, uh, late evening. Above that, we come to the asterism of the Keystone in the constellation of Hercules. And that's an easy spot uh, to find. It's very easy to find that uh, distinctive shape of stars. Um, and you'll notice that M13, which is a very uh, rich uh, globular cluster, is visible um, on the on the right hand side there, about halfway down. And also, it's worth seeking out M92, which is almost a rival to M13. So let's move a look into the Western aspect. We'll look at this a little bit earlier in the evening at 20, 22, 30 hours. Um, we can still catch Mars and Venus before they set at about 10.45. Um, so watch those uh, over the coming weeks and you'll see that Venus is sliding past Mars almost at a sort of daily pace. And you'll see that um, around about the 11th, 12th, 13th of the month, um, you'll see that movement quite dramatically change, the positions change um, over the course of a few evenings. Moving around to the north, we see that um, the bright star Capella is now almost due north. Uh, it's very distinctively white in color. And from that, on the right hand side, you can follow it through to uh, the constellation of Perseus, which looks like the great letter Pi uh, effectively. Um, and it's also very rich star clusters in there, including the double cluster, which is positioned halfway between um, uh, Perseus and Cassiopeia. We also have constellation of Andromeda rising in the northeast, and that is famous uh, ob object there is M31, the Andromeda galaxy. So if you want to find north, obviously you find the plough, and, and two stars, American Dubé, the two pointer stars. 
follow the distance of that uh, pairing about five times the distance you'll come to the fainter star Polaris the pole star this is quite useful when you're setting up your go-to mounts um, when you're observing and you need to find north so moving around to the east this is what's coming up over the next weeks um, we have um, let's say Jupiter is rising by late evening uh, just after before midnight now um, Saturn is quite well placed but still quite low in the sky and Saturn's coming up to opposition in early August and this is a good time to look for the so-called ring brightening um, which is the ceiling effect where the dust particles in the ring align with our perspective and it appears that the rings brighten significantly over the next few weeks around the time of opposition a few constellations to point out, which are old favourites to those observing the autumn skies. We have uh, Cygnus the Swan, uh, the cross shape there, and just underneath that we have the sort of triangular shaped constellation of Vulpecula the Fox, and below that essentially the, the arrow. And some nice objects to find in the night sky around that uh, area, as we'll see later on. This month, the new moon occurs on July the 10th, the first quarter on the 17th, full moon on the 24th, and the last quarter is on July the 31st. This, this month's full moon, according to the American calendar, is the Buck Moon. Um, and if you want to see the moon illusion, look at moonrise around about 2155 BST on July the 24th. Position yourself with the moon rising behind a foreground object like a, a lamp post or a tree or a house and let your brain do the rest. This is the moon illusion. So, looking in a bit more detail at some future constellations of Scorpius and Sagittarius, uh, you'll notice that Scorpius has the red star uh, uh, Antares. This is almost a blood red star in colour. And just to the, to the right of that is a very nice uh, globular cluster M4 and just above it M80. And this is in the head of the scorpion, uh, effectively. It's distinctively sh shown by three groups of three stars forming a triangle there. We've already mentioned teapot asterism in Sagittarius and some very nice objects there to find if you have a good sudden aspect. And it's worth looking for these on clear moonless evenings when you get darker conditions. So July is also a good time to look for noctilucent clouds. These are these very high, 80 kilometer high um, uh, um, clouds in the evening sky after sunset, which get illuminated by the sun below the horizon. And they show a distinctive electric blue tint in color. And they're visible about 90 minutes to 120 minutes after sunrise, or after sunset and before sunrise. Wolf, when you mentioned Mars and Venus in the evening twilight, catch those early evening um, before 10 o'clock, about 10 o'clock or so. Um, and also you can see some very nice thin uh, moons, uh, present moons this month. Um, we have a couple coming up. Um, the 10th is the earliest you can see the moon uh, as a crescent moon, it's 0.6%. But we have a very nice view of a 3.2% waxing crescent moon, low in the northwest close to Venus on July the 11th. There's also the following evening a 7.8% waxing crescent moon and you can see Earthshine with that quite easily. But the main point here is to look at the positions of relative positions of Mars and Venus. Venus is very bright about minus 3.9 magnitude. Mars is much fainter so binoculars will show Mars as a much fainter reddish coloured star adjacent to Venus. So have a look at that. A few comets which are notable only of interest rather than observing. Um, we have comet uh, C2020 T2 Palomar. Um, that's holding steady magnitude about 10.5 in the constellation of Brotes. Newsletter 291 uh, gives you details of those. Uh, again, interest only really. And uh, comet C2019 L3 Atlas, which is a bit fainter, but is still brightening uh, in its trend uh, in a constellation of Perseus, uh, newsletter uh, 287. 
So looking at the planets uh, this month, we have uh, in the evening sky, we have Mer in the morning sky, we have Mercury, although it's very poorly placed. Um, it's an elongation on July the 4th, but it almost rises with or just after the sun, so it's almost invisible to us. Venus is now very visible in the evening sky and remains so for the rest of the year. You can see that the elongation in the sun is increasing throughout the month. Mars is close to uh, position in the sky is close to Venus. Uh, it's now moved into the constellation of Leo. It is re remark unremarkably red in, in, in color, you know, but it's very faint and it's quite small in aperture, in size, apparent size. And you can see the set times there just after half past 10. So catch it early in the evening. Jupiter, we've already mentioned, is a late evening object in the constellation of Aquarius and Saturn is rises slightly earlier in the constellation of Capricornus. In the early hours of the morning, we have Uranus rising at uh, just after one o'clock uh, by midnight, by mid-month, and Neptune is late evening at about 11 o'clock in the constellation of Aquarius. This month, we have asteroid 12, Victoria, at opposition in its brightest later in the month, at the end of uh, July, it moves from Aquarius into Aquila. Um, there is a newsletter being published, which is 297. It is binocular uh, or larger binocular uh, of observable, um, but it's a bit of a challenge because there are only a few uh, brightish filled stars to find it with. But have a look at that. We also have dwarf planet Pluto opposition. Um, and uh, about July the 17th, uh, you can spot that if you have a large enough telescope, i.e. 300 millimeters or larger, and a good and sudden aspect is really low down in the constellation Sagittarius. But as a graphic, you can see that this is showing retrograde motion. This means it's moving backwards. It's moving from uh, east to west, as we see it in the sky, as we approach opposition. And then it will go back the right way, uh, west to east, uh, further in, after the end of uh, August. It is a very, very challenging thing to spot, and you need to use imaging techniques to spot it uh, frame by frame, night by night, really. It is 14th magnitude, so it's not surprising, it's difficult to find. So, coming up. Uh, in the next couple of months, we have uh, two planets which are well placed for observation, even if they're low in the sky. Jupiter showing shadow transits, and there will be a newsletter 299 published, which details the forthcoming uh, uh, shadow transits. And we can see as an example here that the shadow of Ganymede um, is cast onto the cloud tops of Jupiter um, as, a, as a dark spot which moves across the, the cloud tops over the course of a few hours. Um, and you can, you can watch that um, with interest. If you have a larger telescope, 200 millimeter or larger will show it quite well. Saturn is also visible um, and it's an obvious thing to look at. Very nice. It's the gem of our solar system. You can see the ring system uh, quite well with a small telescope and you can see Titan quite easily with a small telescope. But if you have a larger telescope, um, you can start spotting some of these fainter moons as shown here, uh, which change position night by night. Some details of that will be published in News of the 300. So let's have a look at the events coming up in July. On July the 5th, the Earth reaches uh, Phelion at just over 152 million kilometers from the Sun um, at uh, 2227 UT. This is the most distant the, the Earth gets in the year from the Sun. Um, July the 8th, Mercury is positioned 2.9 degrees south of a 3% waning crescent moon in the dawn twilight. Catch that about an hour before sunrise. July the 9th, Jupiter's moon Io and Europa are that very close, only three arc seconds apart at 0243 BST. One for the enthusiast, perhaps. July the 10th is new moon, which is obviously the best time to view some of the summer constellations and clusters in our twilight midnight hours. July the 10th, there is an ultra thin 0.67% waxing crescent moon, which is just 18 hours after new moon. 
is visible for just 30 minutes after sunset and sun, moon, moon set is at 22.11 BST. July the 11th, there was a thin 3.2% waxing crescent moon visible 30 minutes after sunset, positioned just below Venus and moon set is at 22.43. Also uh, on July the 11th, Venus and Mars are quite well positioned as we've seen, low on the northwest horizon. July the 12th, Venus slides north of Mars, and it's about 10 o'clock, you can watch that, um, and you can see that it's also in the same area of the sky, we have a 7.8% waxing crescent moon. We also have a shadow transit on July the 12th, when Jupiter's moon Callisto cast its shadow uh, onto the cloud tops from 22.48 to 03.32 the next morning. Jupiter rising at about 22.51, so it actually rises with the shadow transit in progress. And that's detailed in Newsletter 299. July the 13th, conjunction of Mars and Venus at just half a degree apart. But Dr. Shred is quite well in the early evening sky and catch it around about 10 o'clock in twilight. On the 16th of July, there is a uh, provisional uh, social gathering for LAS members. This is to be confirmed. Um, we're still a little bit uncertain about that at the moment. But on the same evening, the enthusiast lunar observer can watch a uh, clear obscure effect. The lunar X and lunar V are visible on the terminator from 2250 BST. July the 17th, Jupiter's moon Ganymede cast its shadow onto the root cloud tops from 2340 BST until 0317. Ganymede transits uh, right across the disk from uh, 0253 BST in the next morning. On the 17th also is first quarter. And this is the best time to look at some of the shadow details along the craters within the Terminator in the early evening. July the 25th, it's another shadow transit of Ganymede, um, but it is one for the enthusiast at 0344 BST. July the 28th, planetary observers might start to see the onset of the ceiling effect, the ring brightening as mentioned before, for Saturn as it approaches opposition. July 29th is an LAS Zoom meeting where we have a special guest speaker, Dr. Julian Onions from the University of Nottingham, who is a, a modeler of a, a galaxy formation um, and he's giving a presentation entitled galaxies one gig a year at a time that should be a fascinating uh, event so catch that please come along to that zoom meeting also on the 29th jupiter's moon io and callisto also shadow transit um, as jupiter rises at 2200 hours and the shadow transit ends at 0236 bst so a reminder that July, have a look for the noctilucent clouds, 90 minutes after sunset, low in the northwest aspect. Um, catch that if you can. And also, if you're really enthusiastic, you can have a go at spotting dwarf planet Pluto opposition with the help of newsletter 298. Usual warnings, you know, always ensure that the sun is completely below the horizon before sweeping for the crescent moon of Venus. Do not look at any part of the sun which is visible to the unaided eye, or do not look directly at the sun. We've got two events coming up um, potentially in, in, in uh, August. August 12th is a provisional meteor watch for the Perseids. And at the end of the month, we have another Zoom meeting, which is uh, uh, provisionally uh, an introduction to uh, looking at Jupiter and Saturn for small and medium telescope users. So come on to that one as well. So lots of things to look at in the night sky in July and uh, have a go at these things. I'll go out and have a look at the, enjoy the evening sky. Now we're getting slightly darker evenings by the end of July and we'll see you next month.